The alarm bells are deafening, and the evidence is irrefutable. Greenhouse gas emissions from fossil fuel burning and deforestation are choking our planet and putting billions of people at immediate risk. We are on a fast track to climate disaster. This is not fiction or exaggeration. It is what science tells us will result from our current energy policies. This is a climate emergency. Welcome, everybody, to this fourth day of the Sharm El Sheikh COP27 conference. Today is officially Finance Day here at the conference. Uh, so what happened today? Precious little, in my opinion. Uh, maybe Greta Thunberg was right in boycotting the event. She considers the, the event itself to be just a greenwashing exercise. By this time last year, we would had three major agreements signed. 130 nations pledged to reverse deforestation by the year 2030. 100 countries had signed a pact to cut 2020 methane emissions by 30% before the year 2030. And on the money side, 450 firms pledged $130 trillion, representing 40% of global assets, to align themselves with the Paris Agreement 1.5 degrees Celsius warming limit. So what do we have here? Do we have a slumbering giant or do we have as Greta says, a bunch of greenwashing pencil pushers. We'll hope to find out before the conference is over. Uh, this show, we're going to get into finance with my co-host, John Capis, and uh, our team member, Esteban Rodolfi. Uh, we're also going to have a chat with the uh, Senegalese waterkeepers about offshore drilling in Senegal. But first, uh, let's take a moment to watch Michael Fidler's photographic recap of the day, uh, kind of focused on finance. Today, COP was focused on finances, so I will try to provide a uh, quick overview of what I saw and what I experienced. First, I noticed that COP is pretty full already. There are thousands of people uh, walking by, visiting the various sessions, so COP is at a full swing. The uh, various pavilions opened already, many presentations uh, uh, go 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 going on today. Uh, but I want to take a look at the finances from a slightly different perspective and let me start with, with energy because uh, uh, more than ever there is a need for energy and if you have the finance you can, uh, you can afford uh, the, the energy as well. And COP definitely can afford its energy because there are these huge AC units producing the cool air all the time. Of course, among the uh, <laughs> humans, there are these muscle-covered bikes, a nice contrast, I would say. Uh, and I spent mm, quite a bit of amount of time in this media center on the left-hand side, and it's freezing cold air, and just behind the window, there is a hot desert. The, the contrast cannot be any sharper. So I spent in the uh, media center 15, 20 minutes, and need to go outside to warm up, although I have two sweaters on. So out of curiosity, I went just to see how the uh, uh, AC uh, looks like, how it is powered. Talked to this engineer, he was just sh showing me some electrical stuff. Um, so you get a view how some of the uh, how COP uh, gets uh, gets powered. Uh, now uh, I'm sure that uh, in many of the sessions there was discussed the issue of providing direct uh, financial support. But let me give you a small example why I don't think it's a, it is the, the right approach. There are these free bikes in town uh, uh, along the main road and all you need to do is uh, scan your, download an application, get a scan and then you get the free bike. Uh, the bike is probably worth $100, getting a SIM card is probably worth $5. So I've seen many of the local kids already figuring this out and fighting for getting the bike. These, these two kids actually got in a, in, a, in a real fight. Another example of having and not having money. Uh, 
would be say housing for the dele delegates you can afford it you live in a place place like that you can't you probably had for a youth hostel so i was just curious how the youth hostel in sharm al sheikh looks like and uh, this would be the side entrance to uh, to the youth hostel and this would be the backyard i really really didn't want to stay here and it's not that i would be searching for a place like that in the backyard it was the trash was just uh, everywhere in this specific town, simply finance has an e extreme, extreme power. You have the money, then you can walk around and uh, buy all kind of perfumes and spices and souvenirs and uh, so on. It's all nicely and neatly arranged. And then you can spend a romantic evening on a, on a beach or spend the whole day on a beach and in the evening take images like that being glad that you are here and having a nice time because the, the town I mean the, the beach is it's very very nice uh, but then you go to town and you just walk behind the resort walls you see the the, the, the the old town and then you get to the area where the local people live and it's how it looks like this is not an arranged photo this is not that I would have to search for that somewhere in in backyard I simply just walked uh, to the to the old town went behind the last house or on, on, on the street and these are the images taken there this is nothing that I would arrange or really search for that this is how it looks like I went on up the hill on the on the horizon you see the ocean then you see the old town or the souk and then that's what what you get at the edge of town and it's everywhere on each side so here i was just crawling deep up to my knees to get on top of the hill i couldn't almost get down from the hill because the trash was just uh, everywhere i'm um, kind of hell I, well, I wouldn't say that it's all, all fault of the local people the tourists have their fair share uh, as well so just a last image from from this series I believe uh, that's is a girl a small girl on a hair sort of a balcony a local girl that's where where, where where she lives then I climbed the hill spent there <laughs> waited for for the sunset and was just thinking about all these issues so I recommend that you do you do the same uh, final images from today one of the main sponsors of this scope is coca-cola they were giving some free drinks today and there was a huge interest in them people were saying can i have two or can i have three and the the 200 bottles i saw there were gone within two or three minutes this is how the area where the free drinks were available looked like after two three minutes i get i guess you get my point so with being this set uh, this would be all from me today Thank you, Michael, for that overview. Uh, let's get back into the issue of finance. Uh, it's always about the money, right? Uh, John Kerry uh, said yesterday that if the elections go wrong, we will never find money for climate change again. And and we we have enough trouble sometimes funding our own climate change uh, hazards. So imagine how diffi difficult it will be to get Congress, who holds the purse strings, to fund loss and damage for other countries suffering harm. We'll have to pay strict attention to that. So uh, here's a conversation that John Nestevan and I had on finance, thanks. Uh, so John, we said that we would be uh, kind of delving into the finance end of this. It's always about the money. Uh, and we're really happy to have this conversation and we're really happy to welcome Esteban Rodif Rodifili uh, with us. So John, give us your top line thoughts on finance in regard to the conference so far, what you think might happen or where the shortcomings are? Well, a lot of the, the discussion is about investment, not just investment in new technologies, but investment in developing nations to help them with adaptation and, and uh, resiliency to the climate catastrophes. So there's sort of two levels of the finance issue. There's, again, the mitigation and then the adaptation and, and resiliency, and, and also the relief. Some of the discussions I heard dealt with some of the details of, of the financial mechanisms, um, uh, provisions that would allow developing nations when they're hit with episodic uh, climate uh, disasters for them to be able to suspend their payments on their existing 
uh, foreign debt. So a lot of the discussion was in the weeds for the finance people, but a lot of it was was um, more general and, and wide ranging. And Esteban attended some of the sessions there and, and he has some some thoughts and observations to offer. Casey, John, thanks for having me. Um, yes, today, uh, as you well know, was Finance Day here at COP27. And I attended um, a talk about the role of central banks in sustainable finance. And I'll uh, share my screen here just for the audience to have a look at this talk. Can you all see this? Mm -hmm. Yes, we can see it. Perfect. Um, so for in this particular talk, there were uh, uh, there there was the deputy governor of the central bank of Egypt, the monetary authority of Singapore. Um, there, there there was a representative from J.P. Morgan, a professor from the University of Luxembourg, among other panelists. Um, so uh, the talk began with uh, with uh, the the deputy governor of the central bank of Egypt uh, giving some examples of how um, central central banks can can act in terms of sustainable finance. Uh, one of his first points was um, that central banks can start with initiatives for adaptation and mitigation in the banking sector. Uh, they can incentivize stakeholders um, and lowering lowering the cost of capital uh, reward. Um, they can lead by example with their own investments. Mm -hmm. uh, and central banks can establish uh, sustainable finance within the institution and create reports with certain degree of regularity. Uh, what the points that then, then the 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 monetary authority uh, from Singapore um, went into went into some other points. Uh, his he, his talk was based uh, concentrated on risks, and essentially, uh, well, the first point was to monitor the risks, and he divided them into two two realms: uh, heat waves, droughts, droughts, and floods. Uh, as part of a very physical realm of, of possible risks uh, and the need to use measure measures uh, measurements uh, just to, to have an idea of their impact. And at the same time, uh, a set of risks uh, having more to do with the loss of biodiversity um, and, 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 and in, in, among those examples, he 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 talked about the implications for food security, and also he 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 went a little bit more deeper into air and water supply. Um, but um, essentially, what what he said, uh, uh, what he 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 presented a series of uh, alternative scenarios. He's been working with. Uh, for risk assessment, essentially six scenarios among which uh, one orderly transition to uh, to a more sustainable economy and a more disorderly transition were, were key scenarios. He said that the IMF is already using these scenarios. Uh, apart from risk assessment, um, he said that... Uh, um, central banks can provide guidance uh, for net, net zero transitions uh, through uh, information about investment portfolios and, and domestic operations. Um, and, and that central banks can be essentially a facilitator uh, to bring stakeholders together and, and, and forge public-private partnerships. He stressed uh, that Private capital will not come until uh, the the risk and gain are in a better equilibrium, in a more favorable equilibrium on their end. Um, what was very interesting towards the end of the talk was uh, were the points uh, made by this professor of the University of Luxembourg, 
um, among which uh, there was one in partially uh, in a in a in a different sense from from the the remarks of of the monetary authority of Singapore. What what he said was that uh, it cannot be only a risk based focus. Uh, there has to be a focus on public goods. Uh, it has to come through a combination of a public goods approach and uh, a risk-based focus. Um, and, and that's what, what uh, how, he's, how he thinks um, central banks can, can address uh, transition to a more sustainable economy. Did, did you say oh. public, public good, Esteban? Public, public goods. Goods. In plural, yes. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but overall, one, one, one could come to this, this talk expecting uh, a contrast between an old model, an original model of central bank and a whole new model with uh, more in-depth content and, and um, more of a wealth of um, examples. Uh, of how a central bank could act in this transition. And it wasn't necessarily the case. Uh, it, it was, uh, we, ha we had the isolated ideas of the different panelists, but uh, it, it was a good opportunity to actually showcase a whole new model of central bank. And that was not necessarily what was being proposed. So you were a little disappointed, no concrete. Uh, policy or new new programs rolled out. In part, in part, yes. Um, uh, I'm all, at the same time. I understand that my expectation perhaps <laughs> would fit more more a classroom than a talk, uh, mm. and it could be an entire course uh, on 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 the role of central mm -hmm. banks. But uh, yes, up to some point, I was I was expecting yeah. something more concrete and 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 something more voluminous in terms of yeah. Yeah. Uh, the amount of information. Well, that, that's kind of in sync with the conference as I see it so far. We have not seen any any uh, international agreements put forward. Uh, we're we're behind. We're way behind, in my opinion. Uh, John, any thoughts about Esteban's? Um, meeting today and his his uh the conference he attended the session he's attended well you know he he talked about central banks emphasizing the need to get away from the risk-based finance well that's the traditional uh, uh purpose or mechanisms for private sector to invest they they price out the risk and they you know um allocate funds accordingly and expect a return of investment based upon the associated risks. Whereas a government, when a government or central bank, you know, on behalf of the government <clears throat> makes investments, it's often for a different purpose. So while they're saying that the central banks need to look at different purposes, central banks, I would say, and governments do that all the time when they're, you know, um, <clears throat> uh, dispersing funds in great volumes <laughs> with uncertain return on investment. Um, we've seen that in our own financial crisis in the United States over the years, where basically the Federal Reserve just generated vast quantities of money and injected it into the system, not really caring how they injected it or where they injected it. They just wanted to, to keep that, uh, keep shoveling fuel into that furnace so the lights didn't go out so to speak. So this governments traditionally evaluate their investments on a different basis from the private sector. Now, it's it's important that in the process of moving towards sustainable investments, sustainable finance, that both the government and the private sector begin moving towards more of an ecological economics approach, where it's not just the dollar investment, it's rather the performance on this existential crisis, you know, delivering um, <clears throat> accomplishments that help uh, uh, reverse the the trends on the climate and help us deal with what what will the, uh, what impacts are unavoidable. So, uh, if this goes back to the metrics that we've talked about so many times, the metrics are not really there and they need to be developed and they they need to be asserted 
in these investment decisions. There often there will be investment metrics that meet our needs, but they're not actually used in the process of deciding the investments. And that that's another issue where you know I we've seen or I've seen in the water quality sector as a, as a water keeper. When the government, say in Florida, the federal government injects a lot of money into the system and says, we are going to back uh, water quality improvement projects. And then we think that there's going to be all these terrific projects coming down the pike uh, to improve water quality. Instead, what we see very often <clears throat> is government and the private sector repackaging their existing development and, say, uh, uh, drainage projects to <clears throat> pretend as if they're they're serving a water quality function and therefore vacuuming up all of this uh, investment money from the government in water quality, but using that money to actually undermine water quality by uh, continuing projects that, in fact, do damage. So we have to make sure that doesn't also happen in the climate sector. We have to have good metrics and they have to be enforced and they have to be the basis for the decisions. You know, I mean, I don't think there's no way to get out of this hole unless the private sector participates. It has to be a public-private partnership. And the private uh, sector can be motivated by two things. So they can say, here's the market and here's some potential revenue and this is we're going to make money in this. Or they can hedge their bets and they can say, we're going to lose money if we don't invest some money here. We're going to, we're going to have a, a, a collapse of some of our, you know, some of our investments if we don't uh, staunch the bleeding. So those are kind of, and, and it may be that that's the more, the more uh, forceful argument uh, because we're, st we're standing to lose a lot of property. Uh, we're gonna do a show uh, next week on, on the insurance industry, which is on the front lines because they have to pick up all this risk and damage and, and somehow cover the cost of it, which we're gonna see you know, to, to an increasing degree. And they're also, uh, they're also insuring the fossil fuel industry. So we're trying to get them to stop uh, underwriting fossil fuel and, and by shaming them and by telling them this is a dying industry. So these are all kind of intertwined. Again, again, these are complicated issues. They're not so easy to solve. But I have been personally disappointed that have more, more bold uh, agreements have not come out of the COP so far. It sounds, from what you're saying, Esteban, it, it's, it's, you know, that it was similarly disappointing on the meetings you had on the finance sector. And I don't know, let's wait and see what they come up with. Maybe they'll pull a, um, uh, a rabbit out of a hat uh, this week and, and you know we'll, we'll have some pleasant surprises. Um, thank you so much, uh, John. Thank you, Esteban, uh, for jumping in and talking a little bit about finance. We'll try to loop back into this story uh, in one of the shows before the end of the conference. Uh, John, any, any parting remarks? Well, you, you talked about government investment, you know, at versus private sector investment. I think, you know, our government is is doing some of that. For example, last at last year's COP, the Department of Energy announced that their primary uh, focus was over the next 10 years. <clears throat> excuse me. We got a cold here. Uh, drive down the cost of long term storage batteries and such by 90 percent. If they invest in that heavily and achieve that goal, that tees it up for the private sector to then invest heavily in those new technologies when they're ready for scaling up. So the government has a responsibility to prepare the technology in cooperation with the private sector, but investing primarily there and then leaving it to the um, uh, private sector once it makes monetary sense by having driven down the cost of the technology, yeah. then the private sector, that it's a no brainer for them because it's the cheapest form of, of energy and they will naturally invest. Yeah, 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 absolutely. That's what DARPA is supposed to do. That's what our R&D uh, development is supposed to do is, is prime yeah. the well so that mm -hmm. it, and, and invest in money on the front end when it's when the going is really hard and the development you cross money so that the private sector can come in and swallow, swallow up all the, the, the space and, and invest heavily. That's that. We'd like to see that happen. It's. Uh, I'm. I'm not. I'm not convinced we're doing that adequately. But uh, no, so goes. The, so goes the conference. So, uh, thanks, John. Thanks for that, and thank you, Esteban, for joining us. We will reconvene in a day or so. Uh, thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Yeah, as mentioned in the conversation, we're going to try to loop back in in the coming days on the issue of insurance. 
because uh, insurance is also integral to climate change there on the front lines of risk and having to, to, to underwrite all the damage and loss, uh, all the damages that we see from climate change. And they're also uh, underwriting uh, fossil fuel, the fossil fuel industry to some extent. So we're going to try to, we're trying to squeeze them out of that sector and shame them into stopping their underwriting of the fossil fuel industry. Um, this year, the president of Senegal is head of the African Congress. That gives him a big megaphone on the world stage. Uh, on the one hand, he keeps talking about all the green initiatives going on in Senegal. But on the other hand, he's pushing uh, fossil fuel drilling, uh, oil and gas drilling off the coast of Senegal. So it's really a dual message we're having. We're hearing from him. Uh, and, and he's sort of holding us over a barrel, if you don't mind the expression. Uh, he's saying, please uh, fund our loss and damage uh, or we'll be forced to do more oil and gas drilling. So he's kind of holding us hostage in a way. Um, so we had a, a nice roundtable discussion with three Senegalese waterkeepers uh, who are on the front lines of trying to keep oil and gas drilling from Senegal, along with my friend, uh, the Global Advocacy Director for the Waterkeeper Alliance, Chris uh, Wilkie, who's kind of been helping to coordinate that effort. So let's hear from them uh, a little bit and we'll come back to you in a moment. So, bienvenue Mbake. Uh, ça fait plaisir de, de te revoir. Je, on se travaille ensemble. On se connaît depuis un certain temps. Bienvenue au COP. Quelles sont tes premières impressions? What are your first impressions of COP having arrived in the middle of the night last night? A uh, COP is a big event. Thank you, Cassie. Thank you for everything you do for to facilitate our participation to the COP, Charmel Shek COP. COP is big events, big events. And we meet a lot of people. And we, we, we see many people come from everywhere. And the first word will come in my, in my head is uh, the same word. We, 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 we live in the same world. We live in the same planet. Mm -hmm. On the mountains, on the forest, in the desert, in the coast, we live in the same planets. And together, we have to work uh, to work strongly to protect our planets. Mm -hmm. we, exactly. we have to work strongly to have clean water around us. We have to work strongly to, to work in network for protect the environment. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody, uh, um, without the position, government position, society civil, society civil position, and businessman, and local community, indigenous, we, we are all responsibility to preserve our planets. Exactly. I'm happy to be there. Mm -hmm. And and Mbaka, you have experience dealing with ministers. You you have uh, the ability to reach high up within the government in Senegal, and you have experience with international relations, uh, doing advocacy work for the environment. Tell me how you think that might help you try to reach people and and persuade people at COP. Your experience on a sort of diplomatic scale. How how will that help you as you go through the COP this next uh, week? We have two levels. Yesterday when I'm coming, when I get out the plan, I see the CEO of African Development Bank. Yeah. It's the same plan to me. The CEO of African Development Bank is in the same, CEO, the same plan to me. Tomorrow, Senegal is his, his, uh, Senegal is his state. President Makisal is here. And I'm sure I see him. And we meet many what leaders about many big leaders around the same eight items climate change yeah. it's important to make advocacy mm -hmm. for these people and they know they're not alone when they are when they when they when they are around the table they are not alone mm -hmm. community hear them community watch them and community hope big Big negotiation for 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 welfare for 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 better for better climate for better climate everywhere in the world. We need to stop 
global warming. We need to, to develop clean, clean and renewable energy. We need to push down fossil energy like coal, like oil, like, uh, petrol, like uh, gas. We need to have more green solution uh, against, against all disaster will come from climate change. Yeah. Yeah. We have in our country more flooding. We have in the same country, Senegal, more drought. We have, uh, we, we lose biodiversity in Senegal. And all coast of Senegal, 7,000 kilometers are so vulnerable now mm -hmm. because we have oil drilling, we have gas drilling, mm -hmm. and we have many uh, exploration yeah. and everything don't make happy fishermen and people who live near the coast. Yeah. And we need to talk to the government, you have to thinking about all people who live around the coast yeah. and who, who, who are fishermen. That's, that's a perfect segue because now we're going to expand the conversation and pull in Fadel Wad, who's the Barney Coast Waterkeeper, in addition to your work at the Han Bay Keeper. We're going to pr bring in Dauda uh, Gay, who's the Executive Director of uh, Barney Coast Waterkeeper, and Chris Wilkie, the Global Advocacy Director for the Waterkeeper Alliance, because we want to talk about the specific actions you are taking to stop oil and gas drilling off the coast of Senegal. So, in just a minute, we're going to expand the conversation and open it up and really kind of discuss that for, for five to six to ten minutes uh, so that people understand the importance of that effort and why we need to support you and, and Fadel and Dauda in trying to stop offshore drilling oil and gas that is coming to Senegal. Uh, bonjour les amis. Ça fait plaisir de se réunir avec vous. Ça fait pratiquement une année qu'on travaille ensemble sur ce, ce campagne de plaidoyer. Uh, so really, really nice to see you again. Uh, Mbake, Dauda, Fadel may join us uh, in a minute. He's at the conference. And Chris, thanks for joining us. So we've been working together for almost a year. I, I, I looked at the calendar. We started in January. Chris, you've been working with Dauda and, uh, and uh, Mbake for longer than that. So uh, Chris, just give us a little overview of what what we're up against and what we're trying to do there in Senegal. Well, you know, it's really interesting to be having this uh, uh, conversation during the COP and thanks for having us on, Casey. Um, but as the, the, as the world is coming together to talk about the impacts of climate change, what we can do about it and, and, and how we can adapt to it, uh, the fossil fuel companies are not even very quietly going about developing more and more um, fossil fuel production, uh, including in areas that are not currently in production. So, you know, Senegal um, is not an oil producing state, except for maybe some very, very small quantities on a land-based uh, um, oil well. And they're about to enter the big leagues. Um, and this is, from a climate standpoint, this is just craziness. I mean, we, we, we're we still digging the hole instead of planning our way out of this hole. So um, at, at stake is, uh, is a billion barrels of oil um, from a country that's currently not producing. But by the time we get together for COP28 next year, um, Senegal may be producing oil. Yeah. So yeah, this let me is, put up this a, is, yeah. Let me, let me put up a map of the, uh, the areas that uh, they're planning to drill in Um, Dauda, peux-tu peux -tu expliquer vite, vite fait les zones qui sont déjà en cours euh, et les zones qui sont en, en, en perspective euh, au Sénégal? Can, can you just explain the areas where they currently have licenses and the areas where they're planning to drill in the future? Au Sénégal, il y a déjà neuf blocs euh, qui sont en train d'être explorés. So Mais there are nine, nine blocs that are in, uh, in presently in, in exploration. Et il n'y a que trois blocs maintenant qui sont déjà, qui, où des découvertes ont été faites. Le premier bloc, c'est au nord, euh, avec euh, GTA, okay. euh, qui est en, partena en par par partenariat avec euh, la Mauritanie. Yep. Donc, euh, so there are three, three areas where they already have licenses 
one in the north on the border of Mauritania. C'est la production de, 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 de gaz. Yep. Et euh, euh, normalement, les premiers euh, mètres cubes de gaz devaient être euh, euh, fournis en 2022 actuellement. Mais malheureusement, ce n'est pas encore euh, le cas. Okay. Et en même temps aussi, il y a le bloc de Sangomar. Sangomar... Euh, uh, qui est, uh, au sud, uh, qui, qui a maintenant aussi... An another area in Sagamar in the, in the south. Uh, qui va démarrer avec le pétrole. Et aussi au milieu, il y a uh, Yakateranga, uh, qui est entre, dans la zone de Kayar, uh, qui, qui doit exploiter le pétrole et le gaz. Et c'est là où il y a le projet Gas to Power uh, avec le Sénégal. C'est pour la production d'électricité à partir du gaz Okay. Avec aussi simple pipeline. Donc, vraiment, yeah, yeah. voilà les, 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 les trois blocs qui sont actuellement, euh, disons, les deux blocs yeah. ont la yeah. décision finale d'investissement. So, so there are blocks both offshore, offshore, deep offshore, and some onshore that are being planned, and three licenses have been accorded. Uh, so, this is coming. And then, uh, and we, we've been working hard uh, with Mbake and, and uh, and Dauda, and I, and I think uh, Sheikh Fadel has just joined us. Uh, Dauda, tell us the risks to the fishing industry. 70% uh, of the protein for the uh, country of Senegal comes from the fishing industry. And the majority of that fishing industry is not multinationals or, or you know, huge shipping and fishing industries. They are private boats. Uh, they call them pirogues in uh, Senegal. And many of them are family owned. So there's a huge fishing industry, a local, what they call artisanal, or, or a local uh, privately owned fishing. And the risk, if there's a rupture of oil to the fishing industry, is enormous. Uh, Dauda, tu peux nous parler de, de, des risques à l'industrie de la pêche si jamais il y, y a une rupture de, de pétrole? Effectivement, il y a beaucoup de risques parce que le Sénégal, comme on dit, a 700 km de côte et il y a une très grande communauté de pêcheurs. There's 700 kilometers of coast on Senegal, and there's a huge fishing community. Seven hundred acres of land seven hundred individuals involved in the local fishing industry in Senegal, 700,000. Huge. Okay, yeah, je t'écoute. Et maintenant, il y, a, le, le, il y a des risques énormes le, déjà sur les zones interdites, parce que les zones de, de, de forage, les zones de, 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 de liquéfaction, liquéfaction du gaz, et ils ont créé des zones interdites à tel point que les pêcheurs sont handicapés pour ne pas tra travailler correctement. Et en yeah. même temps, la pollution marine, Parce que là, il y a une vraie pollution de la mer qui fait que les poissons se vont être très rares, à tel point que la pêche est menacée par l'exploitation du pétrole et du gaz. Uh, Dauda, est-ce que tu peux parler de la coalition que vous avez créée pour, uh, pour, le, pour le plaidoyer dans, dans la région? Effectivement, uh, on a créé une coalition qui s'appelle Ar Gedi Agnapodi. Donc, euh, trouver la pêche et, 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 et trouver la mer et la pêche. Argedi Agnapoli. Mais cette coalition euh, s'est élargie par rapport euh, aux, aux organisations de la société civile, par rapport aussi aux communautés de pêcheurs, aux, aux, aux organisations de femmes, de jeunes, partout au Sénégal, euh, surtout de Saint-Louis jusqu'à jusqu jusqu Jigensor. Et cette coalition-là s'élargit de jour en jour pour quand même que l'on puisse avoir une force quand même, euh, disons, populaire pour pouvoir vraiment combattre euh, surtout euh, l'exploitation du pétrole et du gaz qui peut-être euh, n'est ne, pas si positif comme on le croit. Parce que maintenant, ils ont parlé sur les retombées financières, mais ils n'ont so, jamais parlé sur les retombées so now, now that, let me just ex, uh, Let me just explain that. So... Uh, with Mbake and Fadel and Dauda, they have created a, a broad coalition that includes uh, people from the fishing industry, 
the women who treat the fish, which is an enormous secondary industry, the, the cleaning of the fish and the helping to, to package them and distribute them all over the country. And uh, youth activists and environmentalists, they've created quite a broad coalition and they are preparing, they've, they've had several conferences and several town halls, which are really astoundingly effective, uh, really, really well done. So there's been a broad coalition, uh, grassroots coalition created. This is the logo for the, the group that comprises many, many different groups on the ground, environmentalists, activists, fishermen, women, uh, and, and youth, uh, to help push this idea and to try to stop uh, offshore drilling. Uh, and and down to, you have had recently, in March of September, a conference on that. Talk talk two seconds about the conference you did in September. Yes, we had a conference national on the issues of petrol and gas, which had gathered all the communities, which had gathered also the experts and also the ONGs, and at the same time, also surely the chief religious. Et aussi les chefs coutumiers, et on a vraiment discuté sur ces enjeux-là, et surtout les communautés de pêcheurs. Il y a eu beaucoup de communautés de pêcheurs qui ont assisté à cette conférence. Euh, donc, vraiment, l le but était de sensibiliser les personnes sur les enjeux du pétrole et du gaz, et surtout les risques que, que ça peut mener. Oui, yeah. so, so at the conference they had, they held in September, uh, which was between Barney and, uh, and Dakar, sort of midway between where. Uh, Dauda and Fadel work and then Baki works uh, in quite a, a nice hall. A and uh, they brought in experts to talk about the scientific and, and climactic and bio biodiversity implications. And uh, they also had the press there and it got a, a quite a bit of attention. It was really an important uh, conference in September, bringing together the coalition groups uh, to support the work of Dauda and Fadel and Mbake. So Mbake, euh, vous, vous êtes expert dans les, dans les négociations, les négociations ministérielles. Euh, quelles sont tes idées sur le, la conférence? Euh, comment, comment, je sais que le président est, est parti hier soir. Quelle est sa position et comment, comment, euh, comment est-ce qu'on peut se combattre sur le plan politique euh, au pays? Et quelles sont les perspectives de l'énergie rene renouvelable? So Mbake is quite experienced at uh, discussing Uh, affairs, environmental affairs on a ministerial level. And he's been involved in politics and he's had, he has quite a bit of influence. So I'm asking him what it, how, how that can help with the campaign. Uh, I know that the president of uh, Senegal, who's the chair of the Democratic, of the African Congress at the moment, so has quite a big megaphone, just left yesterday. I was asking uh, Mbake what his position is on uh, the environment, on renewable energies and on gas and oil. And what what does he think the energy the, the future may bring in Senegal in terms of uh, bringing renewable energies online instead of oil and gas? So Mbake, uh, c'est à toi. Et tu peux parler anglais, en anglais, tu parles bien anglais. <laughs> Thank you, Cassie. Let me try. Uh, yesterday, the head of state, President Macky Sall, in a in a side event, he said, Senegalese have big step in in uh, energy, clean and renewable energy. We have a jump from 4% to 31%, he said yesterday. And he say, Senegalese can start uh, to, to drilling to drilling this year. And when he start, uh, they, they observe all the security level for this oil drilling and gas drilling. And we tell him, maybe oil drilling and gas drilling have some risk. We have oil linking and we have uh, gas linking. Wow. And we have more noise. He said we that? To... The, the president of Senegal said that? In his speech? In his speech yesterday. Wow. In, inside Evans. Senegalese have big jump in clean energy and renewable energy. 4% they have now, 31% is big step. And we go more and more in clean energy. Now we have mixed energy uh, and all power, uh, electric power plant to run by coal. They're running now by gas. 
they sweet them for gas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we tell him, oil drilling have more risk. And we have gas linking and oil linking in the sea. And what the government doing? He say, the first step is no fire when we drink gas and petrol. No fire. Uh, the the, the, the communal, we have fire, burning fire every time. Okay, yeah. He say, no fire burning. And he say, no rubbish put it in the sea. All the rubbish and dirty thing from the, the, the drilling, they collect it in the boat and they put it on shore. Not in the sea, but on the, on the, on the, on the in Senegalese land. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But Jay assurance is not very, very good because we have two times in oil drilling. When they switch out, when they explore, yeah. we have a lot of noise, we have uh, many boats, we have many private, private iron in the sea. No more fishing, uh, no, 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 no fisherman trespassing. And we have uh, many cetacea, like wolves, like dolphin, who come on the beach. We have many tortoises who come. We, we, we never know where are they going. Where are they going? Yeah. And we think when we start drilling, we have many, 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 many problems, like oil linking and gas linking. And when the boat, we have a lot of boats who come around Senegalese uh, port, Senegalese beaches, and it's a problem for us. Mm -hmm. And the fishermen have no no way. They have no area to for fish, mm -hmm. and all fish moved in this side. Fadel, mm -hmm. ton telephone. Ferme ton son. Yeah. So, yeah, that's amazing. Uh, I mean, and many of the areas where they're planning to drill are really regionally and, and uh, biologically sensitive areas where they're, they're, there's a World Heritage site near where they're going to drill and some, some uh, marine uh, uh, parks. Uh, so it's, it's a, it, it, it would be a catastrophe to see them start to start their oil drilling. So that's interesting. Uh, Chris, do you want to talk about, I mean, we, we, there's a really, really strong movement on the ground, a grassroots movement that uh, run really tr run by uh, Fadel and Mbaki and Dauda. Um, how are, how are you helping to bring more pressure to the situation by pulling in international players uh, that may be able to to advocate on a whole different level than what what we're doing on the ground in Senegal? Yeah, well, first of all, before we we move to that, I just wanted to say that the that the risks of oil drilling are 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 twofold in in the sense of what it means to Senegal. So there's the there's the risk of a spill, which would be the worst day for the coasts of Senegal ever, you know, if there was a catastrophic spill there. Um, but there's also ongoing po pollution. There is there are small leaks. We just heard from Mbake that the president says that the the waste from the drilling is going to be deposited on shore, so that that's going to be a lot of toxic material being uh, brought back to the shore. Uh, but what is the uh, what's the compliance on that? What you know the the drilling company may have an incentive to just dump it overboard because it'll be cheaper that way. So who's who's monitoring that? Uh, so uh, you know normally there is a lot of pollution that occurs during drilling, and it's not just the the risk. Um, but I think um, relating to your question, um, you know the international community is uh, is really putting the pressure. We, we're having this discussion during the COP. Um, when when the countries came together in Paris in 2015, the, the plan was to limit global uh, climate change to 1.5 degrees Celsius. And all the countries agreed at the Paris Accords to do everything in their power uh, to bring us in line with, with 1.5 degrees Celsius, because beyond that, the world gets a lot worse. There's a lot more uh, human displacement. There's a lot more sea level rise. There's a loss of biodiversity, um, and and so we really need to 
uh, to hold climate change to the absolute minimum possible. And the best chance we have is 1.5. Uh, it, it gets worse from there. And um, the opening new oil reserves, especially one the size of what we have in Senegal, is incompatible with a pathway to 1.5. The head of the International Energy Agency, the IEA, over a year ago said that all investment in new oil and gas must cease from this point forward. Um, and uh, there are there are organizations and companies and uh, that are pushing for to, to stop this expansion of oil and gas. And just to give you an idea of um, of what's at stake here, uh, they're saying that there could be a, a billion barrels of oil. So what one barrel is 42 gallons for, for those in the U.S. There could be a billion barrels of oil off the coast of Senegal and 40 trillion cubic feet of gas. And when, what does this mean for, for greenhouse gas emissions for the carbon dioxide in the air? So uh, that, you know, one barrel of oil equals about 432 kilos of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere once it's burned. Mm -hmm. um, that translates into 4.3 million megatons of CO2 just from the oil. And then from the gas, it's even worse. It's um, people uh, uh, try to refer to gas as a, as a clean energy because it doesn't create as much pollution at the point where you burn it. But the entire life cycle from the extraction to, uh, to the burning and leaking along the way causes horrible climate problems. The even even if all the gas is burned and none of it leaks, it could be 2.2 uh, billion metric tons of CO2 just mm -hmm. from the gas. So overall, um, it it's quite substantial carbon impact, and this could do you know it, if we do Senegal and a few other areas around the world, it it, it yeah. ruins our chances of getting to 1.5. So there's a lot of focus on reducing demand in terms of converting to renewable uh, energy sources, but we need to keep it in the ground. We can't we, we can't be pumping this stuff out of the ground because if we do, uh, it's going to get burned somewhere by someone. Yeah, 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 no, absolutely. And, and uh, you know, I understand uh, Senegal is over a barrel. You know, they need to provide electricity. So a lot of there's a lot of areas of the country that don't have electricity, uh, but we need to try to push them toward renewable energies. There's plenty of, as Mbaki said, there's plenty of sun, there's plenty of wind, and the risks uh, to the oil and gas drilling are enormous, not only to the environment and the world, but to the country of Senegal, the coast, and the fisheries. So uh, if if uh, and and. Uh, uh, Fadel, who's having a little transmission problem, uh, is the Barney Coast Waterkeeper. And Dauda is the executive director of Barney Coast Waterkeeper. And Mbaki is the Han Baykeeper, who was the first waterkeeper in Senegal. So they've been doing extraordinary work on the ground in Senegal, and we want to support them. So if you want to learn more, go to the websites, or the, the uh, Facebook pages of Barney Coast Waterkeeper or Han Baykeeper, uh, at, or, or follow us on uh, Kalyu Kali Waterkeeper. Uh, or on the waterkeeper lines with Chris's Chris's fine work as the advocacy director, and we'll we'll try to push out more information on the work in Senegal. So uh, we support you. We thank you, and uh, really applaud your efforts. And good good luck with the conference uh, this week. Uh, thank thanks very much, folks. Thanks, KZ. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, we're going to double back to the Senegalese waterkeepers uh, before we before we get to the end of the conference. Uh, they're at COP, and we're really eager to hear what progress they can make this week and next uh, on this wonderful initiative to, to stem the drilling of oil and gas in their country. Uh, so I want to thank our sponsors, the Metzger family, uh, True Elements, and our press sponsor, Florida Weekly. We want to thank you for tuning in and we'll see you again tomorrow. Thanks very much.